to refer to in the script. I mean, which so that which, was decided. Which in some ways, looking, yeah. I mean, I can't remember exactly when that came in, but I, I imagine that that was a rewrite once Chris was cast. The whole every planet has a north. <laughs> but it's that also the way that Rose at that point has is is um, bizarrely actually think about it is responding to the idea of a of an alien as if it's something on she's on TV already and everybody speaks in standard English as if that was ever going to be a concern. So, so her reaction is, as the audience would have, mm -hmm. how come you've got a northern accent? Yeah. What, what, why wouldn't? I mean, in fact, to be honest, why wouldn't he have an American accent? Because almost everything we'd seen on TV for the last uh, 10, 15 years, which is sci-fi, had been American. Mm -hmm. So it would be odd that he was even British, I suppose, at that point. But yeah, that's, that's, that's actually a good point, yeah. Yeah. But but each other, because they, so the days before, I mean, I didn't have a phone which could do texting back then, so we all sort of, in this sort of weird, non-broadband internet connections, all sort of going on, you know, doing dial-up and mm. messages and saying, ah, you just let's get a Mark with and Paul and Steve, and we'd all be getting very, very excited and effectively squeeing at each other. The fact that we <laughs> oh, yeah. had, that we were these special people who had <laughs> Russell's episodes, and, and we were able to read them and just see an actual evidence, because because, you know, i have been a fan since the 80s. Yeah. None of us believed it would ever really come back. Well, yeah. And the fact that we were on it didn't mean that we still believed it. I mean, I went to those first meetings still expecting that someone would turn around and knock on our door and say, get out. You know, <laughs> this has all been a horrible mistake. We don't like Doctor Who here at the BBC. We shouldn't have ever, you know, we, this was only a joke. Or indeed, actually, one of those sort of things where they try and get you along to a meeting so they can arrest you for some for some previous crime. We'd all get them and they'd say, well, thanks for responding to this. You're all here under false pretenses. We're now going to take you to jail because of tax evasion. <laughs> and, and that wouldn't have surprised me either. So getting that evidence that the show was coming back was, was really astonishing. And I know, uh, Chris, he had such a difficult job. I've talked about this with friends before because not only do you have the, the, the fans of the original series who are going to come in, they're going to judge this guy. Yeah. They're going to judge him. They're going to judge him harder than anyone. But then also, you have the new fans they're trying to attract because you can't, yeah. ex you can't exist in a bubble. It's a growing thing. And so you have to simultaneously convince all these new people that this is a guy you want to watch for however long and then convince this whole group of, you know, this, this other group of fans that this is the same guy that they've been, you know, sort of yeah. hoping I mean, for. In some strange way, I think Chris, though, had an easier task in a funny way because Chris... Chris didn't care about it in that way. David, I mean, I mean, within a year, I, mean, I knew David quite well before we got the Doctor. I knew David before I was on Doctor Who doing the TV show. And had David been the first Doctor, he would have been terrified because he was a massive fan. Mm. And he knew what the responsibility of that would be. For Chris, Chris had genuinely never seen the show. He can't. Oh. And in fact, it was only, I was at the, the launch for Rose in Cardiff weeks before it was actually broadcast. He came to me and said, Rob, Rob, I've I've just been watching some Doctor Who. And I said, oh, right. He said, no, I, I don't mean mine. I, I watched some Tom Baker. I said, it's really good. He said, I wish I'd known that while I was doing it. <laughs> and I could have done it a bit more like that. And I said, well, you know. Yeah, now, now, he's, now he's sort of... Waste of opportunity, mate, I said. But never mind. Um, and, but in some strange, I mean, Chris treated it like a third for a job. He didn't care particularly about it being a big revival. Mm -hmm. And every Doctor Who's come along since, I mean, um, I was there for the first read through for Matt. Mm. Um, because who, who of, I was briefly on Series 5 for the bit. And I, I heard that like uh, Matt hadn't actually seen any until he got cast and then he kind of went back. Yeah, yeah, that's right. But of course he was also coming into it that he was taking on this massively popular show that David had made into a huge global success. And so, and David of course had the responsibility of coming on to a show that was you know, pretty popular and knowing he was a fan of it. And Peter's been a massive fan of it. So in some strange way, Chris felt, I suspect, a little bit, well, I'm doing a job, and he was excited by it, and he wanted to do it the best way he could. Yeah. But the responsibility of it didn't, I suspect, weigh as heavily on him as it would have done on the others. Which is the BBC audience, and there was the ITV audience. And the ITV audience were looked at as being more sort of working class. I mean, you know, it's a standard joke that in certain families, you know, we weren't allowed to watch ITV in my home, because, <laughs> because we, were, we were upper middle class. Oh, gosh. Whereas Chris, being, being northern, ITV was more more of the people, and the right. BBC, you know, it's it's a strange thing because you know, obviously now we're in this massive multi-channel environment. Yeah. But back then, there was such a sort of collective 
I idea of, of identity based upon the sorts of shows you watched. And David, you know, and Stephen living a few, Stephen Moffat living a few miles apart from each other um, up in Scotland, so helped, but, but, but having never met as, as, as kids, um, were massive BBC people and watching BBC drama. Yeah. But Chris Eccleston wasn't, so. Gosh. That's, yeah, that's, 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 <laughs> yeah. that's, that's an interesting divide that we don't, I, I'm sure there are some things like that over here, but considering we've had a lot of channels ever since, you know, yeah. it's not quite the same. Um. <laughs> and I said, why well, should, because they're rubbish, they're absolutely rubbish, oh, she's not a fan, she's, and I said, well, why are they rubbish, oh, they're just stupid and embarrassing, they're, 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 I mean, they're these, I mean, she's, you're not keeping that pepper pot, and I said, yeah, I, I, I would hope, but she said, oh, it's just rubbish, it's oh. awful, so I got her to write down a list of reasons, as a non-fan, why she found the darks embarrassing, and they were including things like, well, what's that sink plunger? I said, well, sink plunger. <laughs> Make sure it kills somebody by sucking their face off. <laughs> and she said, they can't go upstairs. And I said, no, well, they can, but all right. Um, I'll do that one again and pretend I made it up. And, and, and said, they can't even turn around in corridors, can they? And I said, yeah. I said, how big, is that, how big a corridor is it going to be? They turn around. And I said, Right, swiveling mid, mid mid section. But what she really said was, what she found very embarrassing about them, she said, they have no conversation. They have no characters at all, because all they can do is just rant and shout and say externally. And so I went into writing that thinking, I've got to try and address all those issues where, where they're not quite as embarrassing to my wife. <laughs> as, because I knew that actually that was a, probably a, a, a basic sense, you know, a sense of opinion. I mean, it was, um, we had reached a position with Doctor Who being off the air in, in Britain where Daleks had become a joke. I mean, mm -hmm. we, we, we had some ads for a chocolate wafer called Kit Kat. I'm not sure you have Kit oh, Kat. Oh, you have Kit Kat. Yeah. Oh, we love and Kit we Kat. we had Daleks doing that. I mean, Daleks would be in the ad, chasing around, saying, peace and love, Kit Kats. And, uh... and they'd become what had Terry Nation had, in, had intended to be a, a sort of metaphor for the horrors of totalitarianism had become through overuse this camp children's gimmicky bit of silliness mm. and it had to be I felt in the episode I brought them back in that nobody thought that those same jokes could be made again and I'm sure I know you made lots of mistakes in Dark because you never really do but the nice thing is I don't see people mocking that they can't go upstairs anymore even though I know it had been done by Ben Aronovich in the previous series, but it's nice that a lot of those, all, that those really obvious jokes about how rubbish the Daleks are don't seem to be the things that people say anymore. Yeah, no, they're, uh, they're, 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 they're scary again, and it's like, you know, I, love, I love seeing, yeah. you know... I was very proud of that. Love, love yeah. seeing little kids sort of hiding from them and running from them. Yeah, it's well, it helps that they've got, I mean, I mean, Nick does a great voice, and, oh, I, he does. and, and, and I'm thrilled that they got Nick. Uh, to do it because he'd been doing the dark voices for Big Finish for a while. And did, didn't he do a Big Finish voice like on Coupling in one of the last? Yeah, 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 yeah. In, in, in the comic yeah. book store. Well, I, it was that. It was that way anyway. I mean, basically, for so many years, we couldn't get Doctor Who back on. Um, any of us who worked at the BBC, we didn't. Have, we didn't have the power. But what we were trying to do, he might Nev Fountain doing things like Dead Ringers. Stephen was writing Coupling and would just put a man working in a comic shop in Series Four so that. They could be on, because that way there could be a regular Dalek on the set. <laughs> he wanted actually to get people to recognise that Doctor Who was an important part of, of what yeah. the BBC should be doing. Yeah. And so therefore when it came back, it didn't feel like it was quite so strange yeah, that it, it was. Yeah, it was, it was still a part of the culture. Yeah. As, you know, stayed. Yeah. And of course you make it up, you have, you have no idea. I mean, I said to Russell, because we worked on that together, because I knew it was important, and I said, well, what did happen? He said, I don't know. <laughs> and he said, you know what? No one will ever ask. It's fine. Oh, yeah. Um, he said, all we need to know is, is I mean, he said, occasionally I, I will just throw in things. But we'll never go back there and we'll never have to explain it. It's just this thing which happened. And we just, therefore, I mean, it's, it's all the sort of Hitchcock MacGuffin. You know, you don't have to actually. So it's all that stuff where you're just, you're writing things about, you know, blowing up the Daleks spaceships and things, and you think, I don't know, because I can't imagine a time war. I have no idea what a time war is. I mean, I had this sort of idea it was a war being fought in all 
periods of time at once or something. But I also can't imagine that because I can't think in a different dimension. So yeah. I just decided to say, it's a war and he yeah. blew up some Daleks. <laughs> probably blew up the, his own planet and I don't know how. And it was kind of fun just to have Chris interpret that. Yeah. Because, I mean, Chris was incredibly committed to it. One of the things which, which is why I, why I loved working with him and why I think he's so good, but also why that scene works nicely. I mean, for example, we all went when we, I mean, I think this is quite well known, we all went to an Indian restaurant um, when we got the job, and it was called Tula in Hammersmith. And we all had a bet to see who could get the word Tula into their script, which Stephen won, because that's an empty <laughs> child. and and. Yeah. We would go to each other's houses and watch our episodes being, brought, uh, be, be, being transmitted. And if we had anything else to show, we'd bring it along with us. So after Dark was broadcast, and I was, you know, I, I was giving out, I didn't actually watch it. I still haven't actually ever, ever properly seen Dark. I, I'm a bit too nervous to. So I've, I've seen bits. I haven't seen the whole thing properly. Um, but Stephen said, I've, I've got the empty child and, or, or, you know, Dr. Dancer's on me. And we said, oh, can we see? He said, I, I, I don't know if it's any good. I, I don't know that we should. And, and we put it on, and we kept having to turn it off. And he kept saying, well, that's enough. And I said, no, we should watch this. <laughs> and we watched it, and we thought it was amazing. And I just sat there and thought, in three weeks' time, they're going to be showing this episode, and it's going to knock mine out of the water. And that night, at the end of the party, um, and, and my wife was there, and she said, Doctor, it was great tonight, wasn't it? I said, thank you. She said, not, not your one. The one, oh. the one with the child with the asthma. <laughs> oh. Because, because that's my wife. She's, <laughs> she's great. She, she is, doesn't like Daleks. Prefers the one with the gas masks. Oh. But no. Hello. Um, I'm a huge fan of a lot of your work, particularly Times of Midnight and um, Dalek. I feel like the fact that you haven't returned is a crime. But um, oh, that's, thank you. Uh, Russell D. Davies was known for uh, rewriting the scripts that he was given and editing, and he was very involved in there. Yeah. Is there one thing that you really liked in your version of the script that he changed that you wish it stayed? Well, it didn't happen much on year one. It's an odd thing. Um, that was a growing. That's sort of this idea at the very beginning of his time that it was a writer-led show, and he said to us in the first meetings, "These are your scripts, and what we say are scripts." And it became a thing where. The BBC above him began to say afterwards, we don't understand why this is a series written by many different writers. So beginning more with David's time, he began to impose himself on doing rights and publishes. A lot of, so, so year one, those scripts are basically ours. I mean, they'll be the odd line change in there. So um, actually, no, not an awful lot, really. I mean, there are things that got cut, but they were, I'm glad they got cut. It has a different thing, doesn't it? Yeah. It does. I mean, I mean, it's. I mean, I mean, there are things because that's what happens in edits. Um, but generally speaking, I mean, it's not like Russell didn't master me. I mean, I mean, I would deliver my my early drafts of Dark are terrible, and have different characters in, and it's it's all about Van Staten's wife, and so Russell manoeuvres you into doing the script he would like you to have written, but you do end up writing it yourself. So it's uh, yeah. So, but, but, but I, I I've no regrets. I mean, I really enjoyed writing with Russell as well. I think that. Russell is, I mean, I mean, I'm not a very experienced TV writer, I mean, I'm about there. Russell is extraordinary. I mean, everything I got from Russell always made me very, very happy. I've never had a situation on TV before where you'd, where you'd go to a meeting and, and you get your work savaged, because you would, and then you'd leave always feeling actually excited and more confident, because that's what, that's what he did to you. He made you feel better about the fact that you're rubbish. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um.